Dear family and friends in Christ, may the love of Christ fill your hearts. May you know the great peace and rest that He gives to you as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You that You have given us a Sabbath rest, an opportunity to come to You, to put aside the things of this world, to take a few moments to worship Your holy name, to shut out the world for a moment and could just dwell on Your presence with us. Lord, we pray that as we come together that we would honor You with our thoughts, with our words, with our actions, knowing that nothing in us truly is pleasing apart from Your Spirit, but by Your Spirit's guidance and lead that we are made holy and we can come to You with our every prayer and petition and find Your rest. All things we pray in the most powerful name of Jesus our Savior. Amen. Back not too many years ago, I'm sure some of you remember what were called the Blue Laws. The Blue Laws were laws that had been put into place to, well, stop work on the Sabbath, on Sundays. You know that stores were closed. You, it, you maybe could get necessities, just maybe. But for the most part, Blue Laws, the stores did not sell things during the day. They were meant to stay closed to honor the Sabbath day. Now, I don't know if you know where these blue laws came from, but it was probably, and I say probably because no one knows exactly where they came from, but it was probably in Connecticut near the beginning of our country. You maybe have heard of the Puritans before. The Puritans were a very strict religious group, and and these Puritans helped to found many of our early colonies, and even before our country started as an official country, and these Puritans were probably the ones who drew up the blue laws. They wanted to honor God with their strict observance of his law they wanted to make sure the ten commandments dwelt on their hearts and in their actions and the blue laws came about now some people have suggested that the blue laws might have been called so that because they were on blue paper probably unlikely i like this other answer that uh, one of the other christians in the early 17th century suggested he suggested that maybe it was because observing these laws made people so blue following these strict laws. Again, we don't know exactly where it came from. But as we think about those blue laws, we know that uh, many, many, they helped to govern our early parts of our country. We, we know that they were part of the law. It's interesting because it makes me think a little bit of our gospel reading, or a lot of bit actually, of our gospel reading for this morning. In our gospel reading, we have the Pharisees who are trying to observe God's law, right? Their goal is to be faithful to God's law, and so they're keeping an eye out on Jesus. They're making sure that Jesus is, you know, he's a teacher after all, so they're making sure he stays in line. And here we have this teacher who's allowing his disciples to pluck grain on the Sabbath. Oh my. They were harvesting, according to the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees, if you go back to God's law, you'll notice he never says exactly what, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as is recorded in the Ten Commandments. Never expands upon what that means. But the Pharisees, in a book called the Talmud, which is made up of about 6,200 pages today, well, they sought to explain lots of God's law. And so they explained remembering the Sabbath day by keeping it holy was that you would not walk more than 3,000 steps from your front door. 3,000 steps, not even a mile, actually. They had pa- the, 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 the Sabbath meant that you would not cook, but everything would be prepared in advance. The Sabbath meant that you would not go and help someone whose donkey fell into a hole, although we hear about that in not too many more verses in the Gospel. Or my favorite is remembering the Sabbath meant that you could not look in the mirror because if you saw a gray hair in your beard, you might want to pluck it. Anyhow, the Pharisees misunderstood what the Sabbath meant as well. They had made the Sabbath a law. They had made it so that, the, that, the Jew, that Jesus' disciples, as they plucked grain, were breaking the law. Notice their concern was not with the disciples stealing because they understood that in that day and age, God had foresight and He told the rich men who owned the field, you're not to glean to the very edge of the field, but leave that edge of the field for the poor, for those in need. So them taking the grain, that was not a problem. Their problem was that they were harvesting on the Sabbath. And so they approach Jesus. And Jesus tells them the story. One that they probably knew. It's from 1 Samuel chapter 21. It's about David, King David. 
The icon of King David for the Jewish people. And what did he do? He took the bread of the presence. Now, maybe you don't know the exact context of what was going on here. David had been running from Saul. See, as you maybe remember from the Old Testament, David had been very successful in battle. And Saul, well, when people started singing songs that he had sl- slain his thousand, but David had slain ten thousands, he got a little on the jealous side. And like any sane person would do when he got jealous, he went ahead and was going to try to kill David. Thankfully, Jonathan, his son, warned David, and David quickly got out of, out of town. He went to this little town called Nob. And in this town called Nob, there was a spot that a, a priest was there. And uh, the priest, although uh, you'll notice in our gospel, it says Abiathar was the high priest, but Ahimelech was this poor priest on duty. In fact, when David approached him, he was literally shaking. And David asked him, do you have any food? He had quickly run. He didn't have time to pack clean underwear or pack a lunch. And so he was there asking for something to eat. Thankfully, Ahimelech gave him the bread of the presence. Now that bread of the presence was bread that was made usually on Fridays because it was made right before the Sabbath. And that bread was prepared and it was meant to be eaten all week long by the priest. But it was called the bread of the presence because it was meant to be set on the altar, the golden altar before the Lord as a, as a sign of, uh, of a reminder of God's covenant care for his people. The reminder that he is the one who provided for their every need. Now, the priest would eat that bread, but David, as a, as, well, he wasn't of the priestly line, so he shouldn't have been eating it. But what is Jesus' point? How does that have anything to do with the Sabbath? Because as he answers them, Jesus' point is the same in both cases. That in this case, God's law, God's plan was for the benefit of his people, not to the detriment. In the, when God gave us the Sabbath, It was not meant as an additional hoop to jump through like those old blue laws made it. It was not meant to be something that, well, we've got to check this off our list. When God gave them the bread of the presence, it was a reminder of His great gift of life and sustenance for His people. And so when David ate it, it was doing exactly what it was meant to do. Sustain His people. It's interesting as we look at those laws though, isn't it? Because so often when we look at the law of God, we we, we get this idea in our mind that that's all it is, is it's requirements for our lives. Things that we have to do. Ways that we have to live. It's not an opportunity to follow our God. It's a requirement so that we keep keep ourselves out of hell. And this affects the way that we look at God and His Word. Well, this isn't the way we should be. Because God's law is not given to us as a series of commands to keep us in line. But God's law is given to us as a gift. And I know sometimes it can be confusing because Paul talks about the curse of the law. Paul talks about the death that the law brings. But what does that curse mean? What is that death that it brings? Well, it reminds us of how we have failed to keep it. It reminds us of how we have treated God's law. Looking at it as an expectation instead of as an opportunity but god has given us his law truly to lead and guide our lives as he has designed us to live he's given us his law in order to make our lives more peaceful more simple not easier but more simple even when jesus came he didn't come to rescue us from the law but to rescue us from sin Just look at, uh, this is from Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Listen to his words here. Do not think that I have come to abolish the, the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. We have God's law as a gift to our lives, as the way he intends us to live. Think about it this way. When we think about the law of gravity, We don't complain about it, do we? Maybe if we fall and trip over a piece of furniture, then we might think about the law of gravity, but probably not. But that's a law that God has put into place, that we know that as the earth rotates, as the the moon rotates around the earth and the earth around the sun, that everything happens as it's supposed to be so that we don't all go flying off into oblivion or into the sun and burning or too far away and getting frozen. We don't complain about that law, do we? But that's God's law. God's law to the, for His creation. 
Do you complain when, when the sun, as we rotate around the earth, as it seems to rise in our, you know, this time of year, maybe we would complain a little bit about how hot it gets, but, but, but we don't complain that the sun rises and the sun sets, do we? That's God's handiwork, His law. We don't complain about that. But when it comes to that moral law code, boy, oh boy, do we ever complain. We, we, we adopt this attitude of the world that, well, we can't have fun because we have to follow God's law. This morning, well, there's lots of people who are sleeping in. How many of you would have liked to sleep in? Okay, at least we have a few honest people. So, no, think about it, though. You know, it, it's not, worship is not meant to be an obligation. Worship is not meant to be a requirement, something that we check off the list. It's meant to be an opportunity to come into God's house, to worship Him, to lift up praise to Him, to come together as the body of Christ, realizing that our faith is not an individual thing, but it is believers coming together, supporting one another, worshiping together, lifting one another up. And when we think about God's Sabbath, the day we come together now, we realize that it's actually more than just a Saturday or a Sunday thing. I want you to listen to the words in Genesis chapter 2. This was even before fall into sin. So this is even before the law was given to, to guide the people. This, is, this was God's original plan. By the seventh day, God had finished the work that He had been doing. So on the seventh day, He rested from all His work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it He rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now God didn't need that rest. Although he had created the universe, he had called it into being, he didn't need rest. But he knew we needed rest. He knew that we were a people who even though we didn't know what was coming, that we would become busy people. People whose lives barely slowed down. We might not imagine this, but God could foresee that we would have lives that would be interconnected so much that we would have cell phones that we would constantly be on those cell phones and never have a rest from our work. We would have lives that would constantly be pulling us this way and that way, a doctor's appointment here, a meeting with a friend here, an opportunity to be out in the community there. All these things pulling at our time, tearing at our energy. And He foresaw our need for rest. Our need for restoration. And that is what we find in Christ. The Sabbath has been given to us. Man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath made for man. Weren't, the, wasn't the, weren't those exactly Jesus' words? That Sabbath rest has been given to us because we need that time. That time where we commune with our God. That time where we rest in, and get away from the world. The time that we come together in the sanctuary have you ever noticed that we call it a sanctuary? A sanctuary. A place a set aside for rest. A place set aside. And that doesn't mean that the stresses of our lives aren't still going on all around us. It doesn't mean that there aren't still things that are going to burden our hearts even as we come in here. But as we come together in His house, we have that rest. But God's plan is not just for our rest to be on a Saturday or a Sunday. God's plan is to give us that rest every single day. It's that time that we come to Him, that we set aside to pray. That time where we shut out the rest of the world, turning off our cell phones, turning off our computers and our televisions and everything else, the, the, the background noise. And in that prayer time, we come to God and lift up our prayers to Him. And He speaks to us. The time that we take to read His Word, that communing with Him, allowing the Spirit to lead us. It's not just that time that we spend in the devotion, but it's the time that God speaks to us through His Word. You know, it's so important for our lives. A lot of people, as we take our time, we, we do read our devotions, which is excellent, don't get me wrong. But one of the best things you can do is to take your time in Scripture and allow God to speak to you through that Word. There are many life experiences that you have had that God will speak to. And how many of you know that to be true? How many of you have experienced that time when you have taken time to, to get into God's Word? When you have taken time to set aside and pray? How, ma how, how many of you have known that peace of God which is beyond all understanding? And it is a peace 
that cannot be measured in this world. It truly is a peace that is beyond our understanding. The Sabbath, the Sabbath wasn't meant to be a series of laws to be followed. Whether it be the blue laws or the laws of the Talmud for the, the Jewish people, that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was for you to come to Him to find rest and restoration in Him. Dear people of God, I pray that you do find that rest and restoration knowing that the Lord's invitation is always open to you as His children. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, we give thanks to You for Your gracious invitation to us to come to You with our every prayer and petition, with the trials of our hearts. We thank You that You hear our prayers and we thank You for the rest that You give us. We thank You, Lord, for Your invitation, Your invitation to us that all who are thirsty, that we can come and drink, drink freely of Your fountain of life. We pray, O Lord, that as we come to You, we would find that strengthening, we would find that peace in this chaotic world that we live. Lord, we do pray for Your forgiveness, for those times when we treat Your law as if it's a burden, an expectation, one more hoop we have to jump through. Reveal to us the way that you are using it to guide our lives. The way that you are using it to give us peace in our lives. Lord, reveal to us the way that you are working to bring us your peace each and every day. And Lord, we do boldly pray that you would grant us your rest and your restoration. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.